himself in the neighborhood of asteroids 325, 326, 327, 329. He found himself in the neighborhood of the asteroids 325, 326, 327, 328, 329, and 330. He began, therefore, by visiting them in order to add to his knowledge. The first of them was inhabited by a king. Clad in royal purple and ermine, he was seated upon a throne which was at the same time both simple and majestic. Ah, here is a subject! exclaimed the king when he saw the little prince coming. And the little prince asked himself, How could he recognize me when he had never seen me before? He did not know how the world is simplified for kings. To them, all men are subjects. Approach so that I may see you better, said the king, who felt consumingly proud of being at last a king over somebody. The little prince looked everywhere for a place to sit down, but the entire planet was cramped and obstructed by the king's magnificent ermine robe. So he remained standing upright, and since he was tired, he yawned. It is contrary to etiquette to yawn in the presence of a king. I forbid you to do so, the monarch said to him. I can't help it. I can't stop myself, replied the little prince, thoroughly embarrassed. I have come on a long journey, and I have had no sleep. Often, the king said. I order you to yawn. It is years since I have seen anyone yawning. Yawns to me are objects of curiosity. Come now, yawn again, it is an order. That frightens me. I cannot any more, murmured the little prince, now completely abashed. Hmm. Replied the king. Then I I order you sometimes to yawn and sometimes to. He sputtered a little and seemed vexed, for what the king fundamentally insisted upon was that his authority should be respected. He tolerated no disobedience. He was an absolute monarch. But because he was a very good man, he made his orders reasonable. If I ordered a general. He would say, by way of example, If I ordered a general to change himself into a seabird, and if the general did not obey me, that would not be the fault of the general. It would be my fault. May I sit down? Came now a timid inquiry from the little prince. I order you to do so. The king answered him, and majestically gathered in a fold of his ermine mantle. But the little prince was wondering. The planet was tiny. Over what could a king really rule? Sire, he said to him, I beg that you will excuse my asking you a question. I order you to ask me a question, the king hastened to assure him. Sire, over what do you rule? Over everything, said the king, with magnificent simplicity. Over everything. The king made a gesture which took in his planet, the other planets, and all the stars. Over all that, asked the little prince. Over all that, the king answered, for his rule was not only absolute, it was also universal. And the stars obey you. Certainly they do, the king said. They obey instantly. I do not permit insubordination. Such power was a thing for the little prince to marvel at. If he had been master of such complete authority, he would have been able to watch the sunset, not forty-four times in a day, but seventy-two, or even a hundred or even two hundred times without ever having to move his chair, 
and because he felt a bit sad as he remembered his little planet which he had forsaken, he plucked up his courage to ask the king a favor. I should like to see a sunset. Do me that kindness. Order the sun to set. If I order the general to fly from one flower to another like a butterfly, or to write a tragic drama, or to change himself into a sea bird, and if the general did not carry out the order that he had received, which one of us should be in the wrong? The king demanded. The general or myself? You. Said the little prince firmly. Exactly, one must require from each one the duty which each one can perform. Accepted authority rests first of all on reason. If you ordered your people to go and throw themselves into the sea, they would rise up in revolution. I have the right to require obedience because my orders are reasonable. The king went on. Then my son said, "The little prince reminded him, for he never forgot a question once he had asked it. You shall have your son said. I shall command it, but according to my science of government, I shall wait until conditions are favorable. When will that be?" inquired the little prince. Hmm. Replied the king, and before saying anything else, he consulted Balki Almanac.、Mm, that will be about about that will be this evening about twenty minutes to wait, and you will see how well I am obeyed. The little prince yawned. He was regretting his lost sunset, and then too he was already beginning to be a little bored. I have nothing more to do here," he said to the king. "So I shall set out on my way again." "Do not go," said the king, who was very proud of having a subject. "Do not go. I will make you a minister." "Minister of what?" M- "Minister of of justice." "But there is nobody here to judge." "We do not know that." The king said to him, "I have not yet made a complete tour of my kingdom. I am very old. There is no room here for a carriage, and it tires me to walk." "Oh, but have looked already," said the little prince, turning round to give one more glance to the other side of the planet. On that side, as on this, there was nobody at all. Then you shall judge yourself. That is the most difficult thing of all. It is much more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. If you succeed in judging yourself rightly, then you are indeed a man of true wisdom. The king answered, "Yes," said the little prince. "But I can judge myself anywhere. I do not need to live on this planet." Hum hum," said the king. "I have good reason to believe that somewhere on my planet there is an old rat. I hear him at night. You can judge this old rat. From time to time, you will condemn him to death. Thus, his life will depend on your justice. But you will pardon him on each occasion, for he must be treated thriftily." He is the only one we have," I replied. The little prince, "Do not like to condemn any one to death, and now I think I will go on my way." No," said the king. But the little prince, having now completed his preparations for departure, had no wish to grieve the old monarch. If your Majesty wishes to be promptly obeyed," he said. He should be able to give me a reasonable order. He should be able, for example, to order me to be gone by the end of one minute. It seems to me the conditions are favorable. As the king made no answer, the little prince hesitated a moment. Then, with a sigh, he took his leave. 
I make you my ambassador," the king called out hastily. He had a magnificent air of authority. The grown-ups are very strange," the little prince said to himself as he continued on his journey. The second planet was inhabited by a conceited man. Aha! I'm about to receive a visit from an admirer. He exclaimed from afar when he first saw the little prince coming. For to conceited men, all other men are admirers. Good morning," said the little prince. "That is a queer hat you're wearing." Oh, it is a hat for salutes," the conceited man replied. "It is to raise and salute when people will claim me. Unfortunately, nobody at all ever passes this way." "Yes," said the little prince, who did not understand what the conceited man was talking about. "Clap your hands one against the other," the conceited man now directed him. The little prince clapped his hands. The conceited man raised his hat in a modest salute. This is more entertaining than a visit to the king, the little prince said to himself, and he began again to clap his hands, one against the other. The conceited man again raised his hat in salute. After five minutes of this exercise, the little prince grew tired of the game's monotony. And what should one do to make the hat come down? He asked. But a conceited man did not hear him. Conceited people never hear anything but praise. Oh, do you really admire me very much? He demanded of the little prince. What does that mean? Admire. <laughs> To admire means that you regard me as the handsomest, the best dressed, the richest, and the most intelligent man on this planet. But you're the only man on your planet. Do me this kindness, admire me just the same. I admire you," said the little prince, shrugging his shoulders slightly. But what is there in that to interest you so much? And the little prince went away. The grown-ups are certainly very odd, he said to himself as he continued on his journey. The next planet was inhabited by a tippler. This was a very short visit, but it plunged the little prince into deep dejection. What are you doing there? He said to the tippler, whom he found settled down in silence before a collection of empty bottles and also a collection of full bottles. I am drinking," replied the tippler with a lugubrious air. "Why are you drinking?" demanded the little prince. "So that I may forget." Replied the tippler. Forget what? Inquired the little prince, who already was sorry for him. Forget that I'm ashamed. The tippler confessed, hanging his head. Ashamed of what? Insisted the little prince, who wanted to help him. Ashamed of drinking, the tippler brought his speech to an end and shut himself up in an impregnable silence. And the little prince went away, puzzled. The grown-ups are certainly very, very odd, he said to himself as he continued on his journey.
the fourth planet belonged to a businessman. This man was so much occupied that he did not even raise his hat at the little prince's arrival. Good morning," the little prince said to him. "Your cigarette has gone out. Three and two make five. Five and seven make twelve. Twelve and three make fifteen. Good morning. Fifteen and seven make twenty-two. Twenty-two and six make twenty-eight. I haven't time to light it again. Twenty-six and five make thirty-one. Then it makes five hundred and one million six hundred twenty-two thousand three hundred thirty-one. Five hundred million what? Asked the little prince. Hey, are you still there? Five hundred one million. I can't stop. I have so much to do. I'm concerned with matters of consequence. I don't amuse myself with bald dash. Two and five makes seven. Five hundred and one million what? Repeated the little prince, who never in his life had let go of a question once he had asked it. The businessman raised his head. And during the fifty-four years that I've inhabited this planet, I've been disturbed only three times. The first time was、uh, twenty-two years ago, when some giddy goose fell from goodness knows where. He made the most frightful noise that resounded all over the place, and I made four mistakes in my edition. The second time, eleven years ago, I was disturbed by an attack of rheumatism. Oh, I don't get enough exercise. I've no time for loafing. The third time, well, this is it. I was saying then five hundred and one millions, millions of what? The businessman suddenly realized that there was no hope of being left in peace until he answered his question. Millions of、uh, those little objects, he said, which one sometimes sees in the sky. Flies? Oh no, little glittering objects. Bees? Oh no, little golden objects that set lazy men to idle dreaming. As for me, I'm concerned with matters of consequence. There's no time for idle dreaming in my life. Ah, you mean the stars? Yes, that's it, the stars. And what do you do with five hundred millions of stars? Five hundred and one million six hundred twenty-two thousand seven hundred thirty-one. I'm concerned with matters of consequence. I am accurate. And what do you do with these stars? What do I do with them? Yes, nothing. I own them. You own the stars. Yes. But I've read in a king who kings do not own; they reign over. It's a very different matter. And what good does it do you to own the stars? It does me the good of making me rich. And what good does it do you to be rich? It makes it possible for me to buy more stars if any are discovered. This man, the little prince said to himself, reasons a little like my poor Tipler. Nevertheless, he still had some more questions. How is it possible for one to own his stars? To whom do they belong? The businessman retorted peevishly. I don't know. To nobody. Then they belong to me because I was the first person to think of it. Is it all that is necessary? Certainly. When you find a diamond that belongs to nobody, it is yours. When you discover、um, an island that belongs to nobody, it is yours. When you get an idea before anyone else, you take out a patent on it. It is yours. So with me, I own the stars because nobody else before me ever thought of owning them. Yes, that is true," said the little prince. "And what do you do with them?" "I administer them," replied the businessman. "I count them and recount them. It is difficult, but I am a man who is naturally interested in matters of consequence." The little prince was still not satisfied. If I owned a silk scarf, he said, I could put it around my neck and take it away with me. If I owned a flower, 
I could pluck that flower and take it away with me. But you cannot pluck the stars from heaven. No, but I can put them in the bank. Whatever does that mean? That means that I write the number of my stars on a little paper, and then I put this paper in a drawer and lock it with a key. And that is all. That is enough," said the businessman. "It is entertaining," thought the little prince. "It is rather poetic, but it is of no great consequence." On matters of consequence, the little prince had ideas which were very different from those of the grown-ups. "I myself own a flower," he continued his conversation with the businessman, "which I water every day." I own three volcanoes, which I clean out every week, for I also clean out one that is extinct. One never knows. It is of some use to my volcanoes, and it is of some use to my flower that I own them. But you are of no use to the stars. The businessman opened his mouth, but he found nothing to say in answer, and the little prince went away. The grown-ups are certainly altogether extraordinary. He said simply, talking to himself as he continued on his journey. The fifth planet was very strange. It was the smallest of all. There was just enough room on it for a street lamp and a lamp lighter. The little prince was not able to reach any explanation of the use of a street lamp and a lamp lighter somewhere in the heavens on a planet which had no people and not one house. But he said to himself, nevertheless, "It may well be that this man is absurd, but he is not so absurd as the king, the conceited man, the businessman, and the tippler, for at least his work has some meaning. When he lights his street lamp, it is as if he brought one more star to life, or one flower. When he puts out his lamp, he sends the flower or the star to sleep." That is beautiful occupation, and since it is beautiful, it is truly useful. When he arrived on the planet, he respectfully saluted the lamp lighter. Good morning. Why have you just put out your lamp? Those are the orders," replied the lamp lighter. "Good morning. What are the orders? The orders are that I put out my lamp. Good evening." And he lighted his lamp again. But why have you just lighted it again? Those are the orders," replied the lamp lighter. "I do not understand," said the little prince. "There is nothing to understand," said the lamp lighter. "Orders are orders. Good morning," and he put out his lamp. Then he mopped his forehead with a handkerchief decorated with red squares. I follow a terrible profession. In the old days, it was reasonable. I put the lamp out in the morning, and in the evening, I lighted it again. I had the rest of the day for relaxation, and the rest of the night for sleep. And the orders have been changed since that time. The orders have not been changed," said the lamp lighter. That is the tragedy. From year to year, the planet has turned more rapidly, and the orders have not been changed. Then what? Asked the little prince. Then the planet now makes a complete turn every minute, and I no longer have a single second for repose. Once every minute, I have to light my lamp and put it out. That is very funny. A day lasts only one minute here where you live. It is not funny at all," said the lamp lighter. "While we have been talking together, a month has gone by. A month? Yes, a month. Thirty minutes, thirty days. Good evening." And he lighted his lamp again. As the little prince watched him, he felt that he loved his lamp lighter, who was so faithful to his orders. He remembered the sunsets which he himself had gone to seek in other days. Merely by pulling up his chair, and he wanted to help his friend. You know, I can tell you a way you can rest whenever you want to. I always want to rest," said the lamp lighter. 
for it is possible for a man to be faithful and lazy at the same time. The little prince went on with his explanation. Your planet is so small that three strikes would take you all the way around it. To be always in the sunshine, you need only walk along rather slowly. When you want to rest, you will walk, and the day will last as long as you like. That doesn't do me much good," said the lamplighter. "The one thing I love in life is to sleep." Then you are unlucky," said the little prince. "I am unlucky," said the lamplighter. "Oh, good morning," and he put out his lamp. That man," said the little prince to himself as he continued further on his journey. "That man will be scorned by all the others." By the king, by the conceited man, by the tippler, by the businessman. Nevertheless, he is the only one of them all who does not seem to me ridiculous. Perhaps it is because he is thinking of something else besides himself. He breathed a sigh of regret and said to himself again, "That man is the only one of them all whom I could have made my friend. But his planet is indeed too small. There is no room on it for two people." What the little prince did not dare confess was that he was sorry most of all to leave this planet, because he was blessed every day with one thousand four hundred and forty sunsets. I can see her. She was not a common rose. She was the only one of her kind in the whole universe. I remember her. I remember all of it. She's not gone. She's still here. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. The sixth planet was ten times larger than the last one. It was inhabited by an old gentleman who wrote voluminous books. Oh, look! Here is an explorer. He exclaimed to himself when he saw the little prince coming. The little prince sat down on a table and panted a little. He had already travelled so much and so far. Where do you come from? The old gentleman said to him, "What is that big book?" Said the little prince, "What are you doing?" "I am a geographer," said the old gentleman. "What is a geographer?" asked the little prince. "A geographer is a scholar who knows the location of all the seas, rivers, towns, mountains, and deserts." "That is very interesting," said the little prince. Here at last is a man who has a real profession, and he cast a look around him at the planet of the geographer. It was the most magnificent and stately planet that he had ever seen. Your planet is very beautiful, he said. Has it any oceans? I couldn't tell you, said the geographer. Ah,、oh, the little prince was disappointed. Has it any mountains? I couldn't tell you," said the geographer. "And towns and rivers and deserts? I couldn't tell you that either." "But you are a geographer." "Exactly," the geographer said. "But I'm not an explorer. I haven't a single explorer on my planet." It is not the geographer who goes out to count the towns, the rivers, the mountains, the seas, the oceans, and and the deserts. The geographer is much too important to go loafing about. He does not leave his desk, but he receives the explorers in his study. He asks them questions and and he notes down what they recall of their travels, and if the recollections of any one among them seem interesting to him, the geographer orders an inquiry into that explorer's moral character. Why is that? Because an explorer who told lies would bring disaster on the books of the geographer. So would an explorer who drank too much. Why is that? 
asked the little prince. Because intoxicated men see double. Then the geographer would knock down two mountains in a place where there was only one. I know someone," said the little prince, "who'd make a bad explorer.、Uh, that is possible. Then, when the moral character of the explorer is shown to be good, an inquiry is ordered into his discovery. One goes to see it. No, that would be too complicated. But one requires the explorer to furnish proofs. For example, if the discovery in question is that of a large mountain, one requires that large stones be brought back from it. The geographer was suddenly stirred to excitement. But you, you come from far away. You are an explorer. You shall describe your planet to me. And having opened his big register, the geographer sharpened his pencil. The recitals of explorers are put down first in pencil. One waits until the explorer has furnished proofs before putting them down in ink. Well, said the geographer expectantly. Oh, where I live, said the little prince. It is not very interesting. It is all so small. I have three volcanoes. Two volcanoes are active, and the other is extinct. But one never knows. One never knows," said the geographer. "I have also a flower. We do not record flowers," said the geographer. "Why is that? The flower is the most beautiful thing on my planet. We do not record them because they are ephemeral," said the geographer. "What does that mean?" Ephemeral geographies are <clears throat> geographies are the books which, of all books, are most concerned with matters of consequence. They never become old-fashioned. It is very rarely that a mountain changes its position. It is very rarely that an ocean empties itself of its waters. We write of eternal things, but extinct volcanoes may come to life again. The little prince interrupted, "What does that mean, ephemeral? Whether volcanoes are extinct or alive, it comes to the same thing for us," said the geographer. "The thing that matters to us is the mountain. It does not change." "But what does that mean, ephemeral?" repeated the little prince, who never in his life had let go of a question once he had asked it. It means which is in danger of speedy disappearance. Is my flower in danger of speedy disappearance? Certainly it is. My flower is ephemeral, the little prince said to himself. And she has only four thorns to defend herself against the world, and have left her on my planet all alone. That was his first moment of regret, but he took courage once more. What place would you advise me to visit, Al?、Uh? He asked. The planet Earth, replied the geographer. It has a good reputation. And the little prince went away, thinking of his flower.